Bedford, in the early 19th century, was the whaling capital of the world and the richest city of its size in the United States. People from around the world came to the city in search of jobs and to start a new life. As the city grew, New Bedford began to have its share of problems, including an increase in crime, and the need for a jail and courthouse within city limits became more evident. In 1829 uh, is when the local leaders here in New Bedford had petitioned the state, as did the representatives of Fall River, because the distance is to travel to Taunton because Taunton was the Shire town, the county seat. So all official activity, the jail, the courts, were there. So what they wanted to do was to have a courthouse here and a jail here. So in order to do that, they had to be declared a half Shire town. So in that, they both competed with each other. They said, the state officials said, we're not going to give it to both Fall River and Bedford at that time. Uh, but but we got to give it to whichever the town is worst. Where's the more crime? So now you had the representatives of Fall River and the representatives of Bedford competing with each other to see who was the worst town rather than who was the best town. Uh, in 1828, <clears throat> through an act of the legislature, uh, New Bedford was added as a half shy of town, which enabled uh, cases, county cases, to be heard in New Bedford. New Bedford was a major city. New Bedford had the uh, seafaring industry and I think that it took on prominence. So that's why the court was built here on County Street in Bedford and the, the jail was created, the Bedford Jail at that time in 1829 on what was called the Abraham Russell Estate. Uh, and that is where we are today. It was considered the western portion of New Bedford because most of the activity, business activity, was down right towards the, uh, the shore. Uh, and so this was built uh, initially, uh, and then they were added on in 1858, uh, and then of course in uh, 1888 is when the Ash Street facility was built on the original site of the jail. Now the original jail that was built in 1829 still exists, uh, although it's not used as a jail. Uh, it is nearby along with the sheriff's house that's next to us. We are in the cage at the Ash Street facility is what they call it. It's a, it serves as both a visiting area, but it also is the site of the, the last hanging that occurred in Bristol County. Uh, a gentleman from New Bedford, who, his name was Daniel Robinson, uh, was accused of and found guilty of murdering his uh, wife. When carpenter Daniel Robertson was arrested for drunkenness in August 1893, he was unable to pay the fine. He sent word to his wife Mary he needed more money. Mary refused to help pay her estranged husband's fine. As a result, Robertson was jailed. Upon his release in September 1893, Robertson vowed he would kill his wife. He stopped at a saloon and after several drinks told the barkeep he was going to kill his wife. Robertson went to the boarding house owned by his estranged wife. He tricked Mary into allowing him in. The two went into the kitchen where Robertson repeatedly stabbed his wife in front of their 16-year-old daughter. He fled the scene but was quickly apprehended at a saloon and charged with the murder of Mary Robertson. In this particular area they set up the scaffold and then they invited people to come, special visitors, but the inmates were allowed to watch from this particular area here uh, more as a deterrent uh, so that they witnessed what uh, the punishment was for uh, a severe crime like that which was committed by Daniel Robinson. This facility uh, was built at a cost of $80,000 and it is one of the oldest jails in the county. Although modernized over the years, much of the Ash Street facility remains as it was during Robertson's stay in 1894. We are in what was called one alley of the Ash Street facility in Bedford, Massachusetts. Uh, it is representative of the many alleys that we have here in this facility in which a particular jailer might be housed. One alley has four floors with 15 cells on each floor. The individual correction officer can go over to this with a key and unlock an individual cell 
but also on the side of this whole wing, there's a lever that can be pulled that will allow all of them to unlock at the same time. The current 6x8 cells are the same as they were when Robertson stayed here, with the exception of indoor plumbing. Of course, <clears throat> the bed facility is here. They issued a mattress. They have a, just a small window that they can look out uh, as the correction officer would walk by to check in on them. And of course, they can look through the door. But then they have their own toilet facility and a running water in the, each cell today. But all of these would not be here back when this facility was built. They would have a small pail in which they would use as a toilet, for example. And then at the beginning of each day, they would be march out in an orderly fashion outside the, into the courtyard where they had a uh, running water, a, a well, and they would wash out their, uh, the various uh, pails that they had. Then they would come in, they would make sure their cell would be cleaned, and then they would go to breakfast. And the breakfast would be outside this facility in the courtyard where they might get anything from uh, a, a hot boiled egg to a beans to a piece of fish of something like that or a biscuit. That would be the extent of their breakfast. Then they would go to work. And when they were working, if they were let out to go to work, making shoes or uh, so forth like that, they would, could not talk to their respective uh, uh, person sitting next to them. Uh, they had to be conscious of what they were doing and not speak. If they wanted to leave to go to the uh, men's room or something, they had to raise their hand. Uh, it was very, very strict up until around the 1960s. And then as things emerged, more programs were developed. Although fewer in number, female inmates follow the same strict schedule as their male counterparts. The women that, who were detained in prison at that time uh, would do a lot of sewing for the local businesses who would hire the, uh, the sheriff's office inmates to be able to uh, perform those services at a particular fee. The revenues that would be generated from the sale of those products that the inmates would work on, be it the shoes, be it the sewing material and such, uh, that revenue would be used to uh, support the operation of the Bristol County Jail. After a full day of work and an evening meal, inmates were locked in their cells for the night. Uh, but the inmates uh, would be lights out around 8 o'clock at night and they had to be quiet until the next morning when it was time to work. The Ash Street Jail served all of Bristol County and as a result sometimes experienced overcrowding. During these times the 6 by 8 cells intended for one inmate would house two. This periodic overcrowding limited the number of women who could be housed in New Bedford. Uh, we had a facility in Taunton as well, uh, and they had more capability of taking care of women, and that is why Lizzie Borden was not detained here at the Ash Street Jail. She actually was detained in Taunton for about 10 months while awaiting trial. In 1892, Lizzie Andrew Borden was arrested and charged with the brutal murder of her father and her stepmother. Both had been struck repeatedly with a hatchet-like weapon. Her trial was held in Bristol County Superior Court and drew lots of attention from the media and the public. She was acquitted of all charges. To this day, people wonder whether or not Lizzie got away with murder. And then when the trial took place here in the Bedford, she stayed at Sheriff Andrew Wright's house, which is right next door to the Ash Street facility. Some of the overcrowding can be attributed to the imprisonment of people found guilty of lesser offenses. Uh, because the uh, people were here, not just for uh, the crimes of murder or stealing and such, but it was a social issue where you detained for uh, the crime of owing somebody money. And debtors were here. They might be here for, uh, if they owed five dollars, they might be here for a week and then be, be released. They might be in here for a few months if they owed twenty-five dollars or something like that. Of course, it was a lot of money back in the uh, a century ago. But when the probation system was created, it really uh, 
allowed them to serve, not really serve in jail, uh, but we nonetheless have all the records for that. So the, the, some of the journals that can be seen uh, up here on the shelves, they're examples of some of the journals that are now at the Mass Archives, because not only it has the journals outlining the inmates, their names, their, uh, their family uh, history and so forth, but it also is the work that was performed by the inmates is also recorded here. So the products that were uh, taken in, the products were, that were created by the inmates and the monetary value of that, that's recorded. The illnesses of the, uh, that were addressed by the medical staff was, ad uh, was documented in some of the journals that we hear. So you can see the certain trends uh, that existed for uh, any kind of diseases that took place in a jail setting. You have that ability to record uh, that. So the, there's all kind of records here. Uh, and then as time uh, goes on, with the you had the glass negatives that you were shown. Uh, but also here is some of the, uh, the more updated uh, photographs. But, um, and it also shows some of them are all dressed up with bow ties and uh, and various other types of dress, so because I think it represents the types of crimes, the variety of crimes uh, that uh, were committed by the people that were detained here at the, uh, at the Ash Street facility. But when they came in uh, into the jail, this, they did not have uh, the, um, necessarily the electric lights and the telephone system of the modern age, all the technology, because the uh, the honey pots, as they would sometimes call them up here, uh, that is those uh, the, they were used as a toilet in, individual for the inmates, and they would have it in their cell, and uh, then they would take it out and wash it out uh, in the in the courtyard. Uh, you'd also, if they wanted water to wash up, they did not have the stainless steel sinks like you have today, but they would have a jug that would uh, contain the water that they would be able to use. But everything was done heavy duty here. The locking system here still is original. Uh, it shows you exactly how they, they were made. And, and with the staff here, uh, not only uh, uh, Major Sadik who, and his fine staff here, they have collectively joined together in trying to preserve this, not only as a working prison, but also as a museum-like uh, facility because of its role in the evolution of the uh, criminal justice system here in this uh, region. Uh, but it shows you everything was done with quality and heavy duty. It was built to last, and it has lasted longer than most jails in the, in, in the state and in the, in the actual country. From the attic to the basement, remnants of the extensive history of the Ash Street Jail can be found. Much has been preserved, enabling us to not only learn about the facility, but also about the men and women who stayed there. Uh, this is an example of the glass negative from the photographs that were taken of the early prisoners of, say, 100 years ago. Uh, this was a common type of uh, film that was used. Uh, and the, uh, a lot of these still exist up in the attic here at the Ash Street Jail. And many of the journals that go back to the 1830s that were once stored here are now at the Massachusetts Archives in Boston. So that anyone researching some of the individuals who were detained here uh, it's very, very helpful because now you can get not only from a crime and punishment, um, the evolution of that in society, say, a hundred years ago, you can also find out uh, a lot about the individuals, their, uh, their place of origin, uh, their age, the types of crimes, the t uh, their ethnicity, uh, whether they could read or write, whether they had children. Uh, all of that was uh, contained in the archival records that were here and are now in Boston, but you also can find out what they look like as well. The Ash Street Jail is one building in a cluster of three that make up the New Bedford Corrections campus. The other two buildings are the House of Corrections and the Warden's House. This is the uh, currently the Ash Street Jail and House of Correction. Uh, the, the Ash Street facility itself is right here. Uh, this is the uh, what is now the Civil Processing Building, but that was the original Sheriff's House. 
And this is the uh, proximity of the original jail that was built here in uh, Bedford in 1829. And in this building is one of the original cells. It's no longer used as that. But uh, this was the first part that was built. And then this area over here was the later House of Corrections that was built in the Bedford uh, around 1858. And then this area here was built in 1888, which included this building here and this facility right here, which was more for the chapel and some of the program building and industrial activity and so forth, where the work was done. Uh, however, in 1993, in February of that year, there was a riot here at the Ash Street facility, uh, and this particular building was destroyed by fire. It was a, a riot that occurred uh, as a result of uh, what they call mistreatment. On February 21st, 1993, more than 100 inmates at the Bristol County House of Correction, Ash Street facility, rioted setting fire to several buildings and destroying the facility's kitchen, chapel, recreation hall, and wood shop. According to newspaper accounts, the rampage began at 10.30 a.m. in the exercise yard. All of them were out on recreation at the time, and when that occurred, uh, they set fire to that building, and uh, it was made it problematic because now you have everybody incarcerated in here. You have firefighters that want to come in and and uh, actual uh, uh, put out the fire, but they were restricted because if you open the door to let the firemen in, uh, then you've got a problem because now everybody could get out. So, and it was, what, in February of that time, so it was cold weather. Uh, and uh, plus with the inmates, once they're out and around and, and, and into areas they're not supposed to, they could get certain instruments that could be uh, uh, a weapon. So it, it put um, the uh, staff at risk at that time. Inmates gained control of the three-story building, barricading themselves in the rec hall. Minutes later, smoke began pouring out of the jail. Within an hour, flames engulfed the building where a half hour earlier, inmates had smashed windows with their fists, sending shards of glass and window screens onto the cars below. About two hours after the rampage began, authorities stormed through the Court Street delivery gate behind a streaming fire hose and at least a dozen attack dogs. Once authorities stormed the building, it took them less than 30 minutes to restore control among the inmates, but the fire continued to burn. Spectators gathered across the street from the jail and watched the fire. Some were concerned for their homes, others for their incarcerated loved ones. But it was quelled uh, shortly thereafter, but nonetheless destroyed uh, one of the major buildings, the program buildings here at the, uh, the Ash Street facility. The structure sustained significant damage. There was a public debate as to whether or not to keep the building. Ultimately, the structure was torn down and nothing was built in its place. It's not cost effective to do that at that time in the space that's available here. And it was a type of outbreak that uh, people could learn by when they sit down because we have the actual raw footage right. of the riot taking place and the fire and, and everybody running around and the various law enforcement people uh, that were interacting here. And it was quite a, uh, uh, a tense moment at the, at the time when it took place. It's something, a tool used for uh, the recruits that are coming to work here on what to do and what not to do because just a simple uh, tone that you might speak to the inmates or a way you treat them could have uh, ramifications uh, because when they're here, they're, their punishment is the fact that they're detained. It's not, their punishment is not you subjecting them to ridicule and everything else. So you treat them with respect and you'll be treated with respect. And that's kind of a lesson that's learned. And see, when you don't, here's what could happen. Uh, because they, uh, you want to generate respect. If you want respect in return, then you've got to give out the respect. And you have to do it to inmates. Because for two, mostly, what, two years, maybe two and a half years, the inmates here, they're back out in the community. So uh, it's not as if um, they're lifelong criminals that, that are necessarily here all the time. There's two parts of the prison system, the jail and the House of Corrections. The jail is where they're detained uh, while awaiting trial. 
but the house of correction is is after they have been sentenced then they perform certain services uh, as part of their keep uh, they might <clears throat> some might work out in the uh, in the yards some might uh, <clears throat> work in the kitchen so there's usually in plus there's educational programs here for the uh, for the inmates as well as well as religious services and a variety of other programs offered by Bristol County Sheriff Tom Hudson. A large parcel of land was acquired by the county commissioners in the late 1980s for a massive new correctional facility in Dartmouth. The current pre-release facility was opened in the spring of 1990 and the Dartmouth House of Correction opened in the fall of that year. The Dartmouth campus was improved in 1998 with the opening of the modular units. The Bristol County Sheriff's Office has evolved into one of the premier law enforcement and correctional institutions in the country. The Office of Sheriff has evolved from its original focus of management of the county jail system into a major law enforcement resource that is valued by every city and town in the county. One of the things that you'll find if you go back and look at the sheriffs, because there's uh, about 24 different uh, people who have served as sheriffs of Bristol County over the years, and uh, the current sheriff, Tom Hodgson, was a former police officer. Uh, however, a lot of them had military backgrounds, so they would treat the prisoners as if they were prisoners of war. Uh, and a lot of times that's uh, not necessarily the way to treat uh, the prisoners, and over the years, uh, the, the restrictive uh, nature or atmosphere lessened a bit. When Sheriff Dabrowski came in in 1962, they developed the, uh, the canteen, for example, where they would be able to get other products, other than the regular meals and such. And there were other types of religious programs and uh, educational programs that were developed over the years. So now these people could get their GED while in, in prison. Uh, there's a whole range of educational programs, also drug rehabilitation programs uh, that have been adopted uh, by various sheriffs over the time and really championed by uh, Sheriff Hodgson. Uh, and uh, a lot of the uh, perks that people had when Sheriff Hodgson came uh, in as uh, sheriff, oh, having their own TV or, or weight room at, at, uh, and things like that, and smoking eliminated the sheriff this is what he his philosophy was that he didn't want people to, to, to come back he wanted when they hear that they would dread coming to jail because a lot of times you'd have repeat offenders that all of a sudden when the winter come the cold weather comes they'd be back in jail again they'd lift weights they'd become stronger than the correction officers and therefore pose a, a risk to the health and safety of the correction officers so what he did is he removed a lot of those perks the gymnasium uh, that existed in uh, in Dartmouth was was removed and now it's a it's a housing facility so that when they hear uh, and you t you poll the inmates you'll find out that they don't want to come back to the jail run by Sheriff Hodgson because that's not a country club and that's what they elected the sheriff to do to make sure to to, uh, to do his best to, to save money uh, but also to run it more effectively and uh, and he has done that and, and then some because a lot of the inmates, when they get close to the edge of their, of their service, uh, uh, they're screened, but then they'd go out into the community and give back to the communities, uh, doing uh, uh, road work, uh, maybe cleaning parks and do anti-graffiti uh, units, uh, things like that. Uh, so they're giving back to society that which they you know, took from them. So that has been a, a, a good program championed by Sheriff Hodson to make sure, he says, look, why should we have people, for example, uh, we have to have a cake sale for kids in, in school on the right side of the law, but yet prisoners will be given everything. Uh, you know, there, there's a certain, uh, we gotta put things in certain perspective. The Ash Street Jail remains an active facility and is one of the oldest continuously operated jails in the United States.